It was a warm mid-May afternoon in 1976 when I walked into the Coliseum restaurant on 59th Street in Columbus Circle. J.J. was a slender middle-aged man. He smiled and waved to me from a corner table as I entered the room. Neither of us being much for small talk, we got right to brass tacks. I'm glad you called, Joe, J.J. started, patting his lips with a silk handkerchief after each sip of Michelob. But are you sure this is what you want to do? I could always put you to work across the street in the Coliseum. You can make a good buck, and that isn't why I came down here, J.J. Can you use me? I asked, looking to his piercing blue eyes. J.J. was a stylish dresser and was still a good-looking man with his silver-black hair and almost quaint, pale face. I first met him in Queens House of Detention in 1965 while I was awaiting trial for manslaughter. We hit it off well. I didn't see him again until 1971 when I escaped from Attica. After doing about five years on my 20 to 30 year bid, I was hot as a pistol and the whole world seemed to be hunting me. But JJ never shut his door. He looked out for me with money and a place to stay and I never forgot that. Yeah, I can use you, he smiled. I know you're capable and handled yourself well all those years in the joint. And your escape shows me you have ingenuity and you're daring. But I just want to know, it's one thing fighting with your hands or even using a pipe or a knife to defend yourself when you got no choice. A lot of guys do that every day in prison. But see that guy sitting over by the door? He pointed. Yeah, what about him? I was puzzled. Never seen him before. He smiled. I looked at the guy closer. Nah, never. Well, then would it bother you if I passed you a piece beneath the table and asked you to blow his brains out before we walked out of the door? He whispered softly. Just like that, huh? I couldn't help but grin. Yeah, my friend, just like that, he replied. Damn, I laughed. Is he the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, or somebody else? Does it matter to you who or what he is, Joe? He's not one of us. J.J. spoke with finality as our eyes searched and finally nodded in agreement. No, J.J., it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter at all. I sighed, burying any shred of feeling left from my fellow man. Well, his name is Tommy Devane. He's with Mickey Spillane's crew, the last remnants of the old Irish mob, and nothing to do with the younger guys, those so-called Westies, who have hooked up with the Pope, Castellano, and Brooklyn. These guys have been snatching wise guys from both the Gambino and Genovese crews and demanding anywhere up to 200 grand to get them back. Only problem is... They don't come back. These bums have been choking them up. J.J. snapped angrily. What do you want to do, J.J.? I offered. This ain't the place, Joe. Go home. Get a good night's sleep. Pick me up outside this joint at 8 tomorrow morning. I've been trying to pin this cocksucker down for six months. He's back and forth between New York and Montreal and only in for a friend's funeral over on Lexington Ave. I'll have everything we'll need. You all right? He smiled. I'm fine, J.J. Don't worry about me. Racing across the 59th Street Bridge from Queens the following morning, I felt all pumped up like I was going to a high school prom. I wasn't nervous, but a bit high strung in my desire to make my debut in a dramatic and successful fashion. I hadn't the slightest doubt as to the outcome. I had complete faith in my condition, stealth, ability, and kaputs. As far as I was concerned, this bird was already history, and I looked forward to dispatching that entire crew. My first surprise in this new life was learning that J.J., being Irish, was with the fat guy and the Genovese family, and had been for 30 years. Having been in the can all my life, I was unaware that there was no longer a singular solidified Irish crew left in Hell's Kitchen's west side. There were a dozen or so dinosaurs ethnic remnants and offspring of the past era whose history dated back to Oni Madden and his famous Cotton Club, whose own genesis derived from the Irish immigrant gangs, which sprang up to claw for survival in a hostile new world upon reaching these shores at the turn of the century. 
A donkey's options were severely limited in those days. Strong back, but no brains. So along with the infamous gophers, Hudson dusters, and Arsenal gangs, who made it known that they were here to stay and would get their fair dole by hook or by crook, Mickey Spillane led the older of the remaining remnants during the gentrification period of Hell's Kitchen during the 1970s. The young lions, detectives in the neighborhood precinct, dubbed the Westies, were a separate entity and bitter rivals for whatever scraps were left from the Roman banquet. The Westies, in essence, were a conglomeration of the displaced Irish left behind in the changing ethnic mean streets of Hell's Kitchen, now referred to as Clinton. They were a band of childhood friends whose two common denominators were the hunger from a shared prison experience and Jimmy Coonan. Coonan was one of theirs. While unlike themselves, his prison experience allowed him to rise above or better yet put aside the old ethnic prejudice at Irish versus Italian because of a personal feud between his family and Mickey Spillane in spite of the innate distrust he and his followers held for the Italians, who they referred to as the Linguini mob. Jimmy finally saw the futility of it all. He offered the olive branch to Poli Castellano and the Gambino family, or so he thought. In a nutshell, he proposed that if Big Pauli would help him get rid of the old timers, Spillane and company, he and his Westies would protect mob interests on all of Manhattan's west side against the growing insurgence of new ethnic groups, Puerto Ricans, Colombians, etc., that now dominated the neighborhoods. Of course, he expected a steady piece of the pie from numbers and loan sharking specifically. What Coonan didn't know, however, was that both Castellano, Gambino, and the fat guy, Genovese, were acting in concert to rid the west side of both Irish factions, considering them too wild, unmanageable, and bad for business. Game plan was, once the small number of old-timers were displaced, then both families would focus their attention on the Westies, specifically Jimmy C., and a half dozen other thinkers. What I felt was of little consequence as I had committed myself to J.J. and would play out my hand. J.J. was waiting by the curb and I pulled up. He was dressed in light slacks, a windbreaker, and a floppy sun hat. What? Who? He started in shock. Then his face lit up with a smile of amazement. What do you think? I laughed. Son of a bitch! He exclaimed. You could have passed me on the street and I wouldn't have known you. Where did you... Compliments a drama class I joined at Potsdam University while I was in Clinton Prison. We put on a lot of shows, a few things for Channel 13, the educational channel, I laughed. A makeup wardrobe, you know, came with the territory. Great, Joe. Just great. But does that shit come off easy? He asked, referring to my hazelnut coloring beneath the medium-sized Afro wig that gave me the appearance of a dark Hispanic. I also penciled my eyebrows and mustache. No problem, buddy. I got a half-wet towel and a plastic bag on the back floor. This light-based grease comes off as quick as the afro. The suit and tie is simply to give me a touch of respectability. Don't want nobody thinking I'm some common street mugger that bears watching. JJ and I shared a light breakfast. Then he directed me to a bar on Lexington Avenue, right across the street from a funeral parlor where Devane would be attending a wake. Listen, Joe, you sure you don't need me in there with you? He sounded worried. Nah, don't worry, JJ. I can move better if I'm alone. Just park around the corner and don't forget to slap those dealer plates with the magnets over the back license plate. I'll find you, I said, breathing deeply. All right, but remember, he may stop in the bar before he goes to the wake. He might have to wait a few minutes, so drink real slow. Also, he may be with a few friends, so enough. I laughed feeling the weight of the 38 snub in my right-hand jacket pocket as I slid out of the car and crossed the pavement into the dimly lit bar, not looking back. A long Formica top bar ran along the wall to my left. There was a cigarette machine, a phone, and a jukebox to my right. The pool table was directly to the rear. 
There wasn't much of anybody to see except an old-timer seated midway down the bar and a stocky, beefy-faced guy behind the bar wearing an open-neck white shirt and an apron tied around his waist. He was polishing some beer glasses while bullshitting with the old-timer. Hey, buddy, I nodded as I passed them. Let me have a Michelob, huh? I said, finally settling on the stool farthest from the door. I faced the door as I seated myself at an angle, pretending interest in their gossip. I was in there about 20 minutes, sipping from my second draft, when the door opened and Devane walked in with three other guys. I glanced their way purposely, as it's a person's natural curiosity to do. I would have tipped my hand if not, especially with a fellow predator. After glancing in their direction, I casually returned to my beer. Damn, I know the little bald-headed guy from Attica. I looked right at him, but he didn't recognize me. No wonder I smiled at the dark-skinned Latino with the afro in the mirror behind the bar. They didn't sit down, but ordered shots and beers while standing around the short end of the bar, about 10 feet from the door. Probably just a quick drink and out. Showtime. I wiped the glass with my napkin and did the same with two single bills beneath the edge of the bar before setting them down and eased the 38 out of my pocket, holding it down along my leg and slightly behind as I walked close to the stools on my way out. Take care, buddy, I called to the bartender as I passed him and the old timer, and the same time I was watching the foursome to see if they were alert to my leaving. They were not. Devane had just lifted the beer to his lips when I brought my arm straight up, stopping inches from his ear as I pulled the trigger. The dull roar of the weapon echoed in one part of my mind while the other concentrated on the three men that had been facing him, all now wearing the same looks of fear as the shattered bits of bone and blood sprayed their horrified faces. I hadn't broken stride on my way to the door, and never took my eyes off them as I stepped outside onto the deserted street. I broke into a slow jog that wouldn't attract any attention. All right, buddy, let's roll. I smiled, sliding into the front seat and then reaching over to get the plastic bag with the wet towel in it. You got him already? He's dead? JJ gasped. Does a bear shit in the woods? If he's alive, buddy, he's going to have a lifetime migraine. I laughed as he drove away, using one hand while pounding me congratulatory on the shoulder as I wiped the makeup from my face, neck, and hands. Son of bitches, he shouted gleefully. We'll kill all those low-life cocksuckers, all of them. No problem, JJ. But first, I got a long-delayed vacation to go on with Gail, a cruise to Nassau. We planned it for months, and I look forward to my love boat. Great, good for you. I hope you both enjoy yourself, he said sincerely. I'll have some money for you in a few days. We never discussed how much I would make from my work. After all, I felt JJ would be fair with me. This was not the case, as I got a few thousand once in a while and a no-show job. They kept the hundreds of thousands that the contracts were going for. I was the fool, but didn't think of it that way at the time. Like everything else, I thought eventually... They would be loyal and good to me because I was that way with them, but it never came about. Gail and I were always at our best and happiest when traveling alone together and were left to our leisure. The ship we sailed on from Pier 52 was in all respects our love boat. It was called the Oceanic and sailed under Panamanian colors, but with an Italian crew that promised a gourmet menu around the clock. That cruise outdid all our expectations. For three days going, three days sailing back, and the three days spent on land in Nassau, we had the time of our lives. We sunbathed and drank pina coladas on the lower deck by day when I wasn't in the pool trying to teach Gail to swim, though to this day she's a human rock. And late in the evening, we'd sneak off to the upper deck like two kids ducking out to school and make love to the soft lapping sounds of the water as the huge steel fish plowed its way toward Nassau. The white sand and blue-green waters of the island were equally enticing. 
but the biggest highlight of our stay, a debacle really, happened when we first docked and I saw all the different couples renting mopeds to get around on the island. You sure you know how to drive one of these, Joe? Gail looked at me cautiously, probably recalling how she had just taught me to drive a car a few months before. Sure, no problem, I blustered. I mean, how fast can these things go? 40, maybe 50 miles an hour? Ain't no different than a bike, right? Oh, Joe, she sighed in surrender. We'll get one. I forgot exactly what I did wrong the first time, but no sooner did I leave off the dock, Gail screaming in my ear, and take the highway that circled the island. I met a curve I thought I'd have no problem maneuvering through, but I twisted the hand grip for the gas instead of the brake, and we went off the highway into some wooded area of pine trees, sliding on the soft blanket of pine needles until we crashed. Gail, Gail, are you all right, honey? I felt terrible. She was shaking, but okay. Oh, Joe, she gasped. I thought you knew how to drive this thing. She glared at me accusingly. I do, I do. It's just it's been so long. I thought the gas was the break. I started grinning, and then the both of us burst out laughing. My second incident, about ten minutes later, wasn't humorous at all. Somehow, going down a perfectly straight highway, I kept veering to the left. Despite Gail's calm directions on how to rectify my error, I was mesmerized like a mosquito to a zapper and went off the road onto a grassy area. I started my seemingly graceful hook slide into the second base. When we hit the ground on our left side, I thought I had held the moped up off our bodies with my outstretched arms, but then I turned and saw Gail laying on the grass holding her left calf. She was moaning softly because of the deep three-inch burn that had been inflicted by the hot engine that had pressed against her on impact. Tears just ran quickly from my eyes, all this because I was too macho to allow her to drive while I sat behind her, holding on like some wimp. She looked up at me and hissed like a cobra. You son of a bitch! She spat out one word at a time, each with great emphasis. Gail, listen, I'm sorry, I began weakly. Get on the back, she snapped, lifting the seamlessly harmless moped from the ground. I'm doing the driving. She glared at me defiantly. Okay, okay. I held up my hands, smiling weakly as I pointed to all the couples zipping past with the traditional male driving, the female holding on to her hero for dear life. All right, Gail, but you know what this will do to my image. Fuck your image, Sully. Look what you did to my leg. She was right. What could I do? I spent the rest of my day with my hands holding on to her waist, daring anybody to question my manhood with malevolent stares. My son still laugh at the story 18 years later. We had a wonderful time during our vacation. I dreaded returning to the life I had embarked upon and that other person I'd never dared to analyze. 